chase after Jesus. What a joy it is to see them go and study, just like we will do. Um, what a joy it is to be able to come to the Word of God and to, to be able to study. And, and you know what's, what's interesting about those songs that we sing is that those are words wrought with deep spiritual truth that stand the test of years and uh, of time. So eternal truth that helps our, our hearts to, to kind of draw closer to the Lord and to think rightly about him. Uh, we've been looking at the Gospel of John and uh, the impact of, of Christ and the resurrection. And, and over the last few weeks, we've been asking people to come up and just share their testimony. And, and none is so different right here. We're going to have Dory come up and share Christ and, and, and why Jesus, I guess, is kind of the, uh, what I asked Dory to share with us. And so, Dory, it's all yours. Well, my testimony doesn't tell as well as other than the fact that angels rejoiced in heaven and my mother here on earth, it really isn't a dramatic story. Um, I was raised in the church from the time I was born, as was my mother and her parents before her. Going to church was just something we did, like breathing and eating. It never occurred to me that there were people who didn't go to church. Um, I grew up loving the church. I loved the hymns and the stories and the people there, and I loved Jesus. I knew who he was and that he died for my sins. We went to church three times a week, Sunday morning, Sunday, including Sunday school, Sunday night and Wednesday nights. Even as I grew older, church still was just a part of me. It was who I was. I believed in heaven and hell, and I knew I had to be right with God in order to spend eternity with him. But it wasn't until I was in high school that I realized that I was attempting to ride into heaven on my mother's relationship with Jesus, paired with a really good head knowledge of God. I was at a Christian concert with um, our youth group, and there it was impressed on me that while I knew... Was there a youth pastor there, by chance? I do not remember. Okay. All right. I don't remember. Okay. It was a Ray Bolts concert. Were you there? I was there. Okay. <laughs> All right. So God can use anybody, even Ray Bolts. And maybe a pastor, too. And, and maybe and a pastor, pastor, too. Yeah. Um, there story it was short, I, I was Dory's youth pastor way back when she was a youngin'. So go ahead. This Dory. is my story. I, I know. I have to... <laughs> I'm just helping you. Guys, guys have certain Am views. Am I leaving stuff out? Well, I'm just trying to encourage you. All right. Okay. If it weren't for my youth pastor who got me to this concert. Yes, I drove. There we go. I there drove. We go. It was impressed on me there that I knew who Christ was and that I believed in what he did, but it had not really affected my heart. I can't really say if the concert, the Ray Bolt said something in particular that struck me, but I just knew things were not okay between me and God. And if I died that night, it would not be the pearly gates that I stood before. The Bible says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. It also says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. And that was me, and I knew I could not stand before him. So a dear friend of my mother's who was sitting with me at the concert went down to the altar with me, and there I confessed my sins and gave my life to Christ. Over the next few years, I was much like a baby learning to walk, stumbling around trying to figure out life as a teen and a Christian, falling and getting back up again. And God never let me get away with anything, and I would often face his loving discipline for my choices. It didn't feel loving at the time, only when I look back. But he is merciful and so full of grace, and time and time again, he made something beautiful out of my ashes. Through the years, my walk as a Christian has been a pretty easy one, untouched by not many trials and tribulations. I'm what I consider a comfortable Christian, until about eight years ago when things started to get a little rocky. It seems sometimes since then that trials and hurdles, heartbreak and defeat have been a constant companion. Stretching and growing and learning to die to self were and still are a daily struggle. Over those same years when it feels like things were being stripped away from me, God was continually filling me with his spirit and bringing me comfort, comfort that could only be found in him. He has blessed me beyond measure with my husband and my children and my godly friends. He has taught me innumerable things through his Bible studies and through the lives of Titus, two women he's brought into my life. He asks me to trust him more and more every day in some new way. And every time I think he's done asking me to do some hard thing, he stretches me in him and I grow a little bit more. And I'm willing to give up a little bit more. It always surprises me to realize that the things I held so tightly to, I hardly miss when they're gone. This will come as a surprise to bear. Stubbornness and desire to control things are second nature to me. 
Shocking, huh? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> While trusting and following someone else's lead, I can hardly even comprehend that concept. Over the years, God has used all of my trials and heartbreaks to bring me to my knees over and over again to cry out, Lord, I can't do this. I cannot take any more. And every time he reminds me that, no, you can't, but I can. And most importantly, I will. He continually tells me to let go and trust him. And apparently I'm a slow learner because just when I think I've got it good, he shows me that I so do not. And every time he shows me that, he proves faithful to his word, all the while filling me with a new and stronger desire to be completely sold out for Christ. Over the last few years, and especially in the last year, it has become my wholehearted cry that I be poured out and used up at the feet of Jesus, that I run his race with every bit of strength and energy I have. I pray that my life and my words would do nothing but point people back to Christ. I don't want to be like the people in Noah's day, where they were eating and drinking and being married, just living a life full of a fruitless busyness, like they had all the tomorrows before them, without a care for themselves or the people around them, while someone else toils away for the kingdom of God. I hope that when I stand before Christ, that I stand there with nothing left to give, because I used up every bit of me for him. So maybe my testimony tells a little better than I thought, but it's not because it's my testimony. It's because it's the testimony of God and what he's done in my life. When I look back at who I was before Christ and then at who I am in Christ, there is a dramatic difference. And I know there's even more change to come as Christ continues to refine me to the point that when people look at my face, they don't see me anymore, but they see the reflection of my heavenly father. Thank you. Really well, well said, Dory. Um, you know, the dynamics of a Christian home, uh, you, you alluded to that, and I know that's your desire to raise up your kids that way. Um, let me just ask you this question, I'm putting you on the spot. Uh, that's what pastors do. Um, why Jesus? Why not go the way of the world or the way of success, the ways of, of your accomplishments? Why, why, why Jesus at that moment at the concert? Why not? Okay. I mean, I, I had no other choice. There was the way of the world was not an option. I mean, I just, I've seen the way of the world. It's despair and it's heartbreak. And I knew there were things to come. There's yeah. no way I could have gotten through them without Christ. Yeah. There's just, there is no other option. So if you're sitting here today and your life now as a Christian doesn't look different than it did, if you don't see yourself growing and stretching, you might want to have a sit down with the Lord. Make sure you're growing. Because there is no other option. There is no other way. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, and I think the beauty of what she is saying is, is this, just the relationship the fact that uh, she saw that relationship and still does with her mother and uh, knowing that as truth and the spirit just pierces you and it comes down. This, we're talking about a living relationship with the God Almighty, and which is was pretty powerful in itself. The creator of all the universe. I was just the other night just in, um, in the backyard and looking up and, and seeing the constellations and, and saying, man, I know the God who made those and he knows me. Pretty powerful stuff. He's not some distant God who desires to have this distant and cold, orthodox type of relationship. He wants to have a vital relationship with you. Let us pray, and we'll, we'll dive into our study this morning. Father, we, we thank you for your redemption. Your redemption that we have, have seen in Christ Jesus and, and for many have experienced because of faith in you, Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for your plan, your power, your your provision as you went to the cross to die for my sin, our sin. For you are life and you are salvation. You have given redemption to those who, who have put their faith in you. And lives are changed, transformed, made anew. And we rejoice. We rejoice in knowing that, that you are our God. Father, as we approach your, your word, we, we pray, Lord, that you will continue to draw our hearts towards your truth. Help us to understand what it means to, to live with Christ and for Christ and this vital relationship that Dory has spoken about. And I just pray, Lord, that you will continue to, to break us and, and mold us.
and shape us into your likeness. To be, as Doria said, that people would see Christ in us by what we say and what we do. That the heart, our heartbeat is, is all about you, Lord. Be with our study, be with your servant. We pray, Spirit, that you would teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. Open your Bibles to John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Uh, we began this chapter last week looking at an illustration. As you well know, this is a narrative. This is John's account of the living Christ and why he has come and, and, and why he is here. And, and of course, it all pointed to the cross, didn't it? The miracles, the divinity of Jesus, the, the fact that he was God. And to be able to endure and bear the, the sins of the world was displayed when he stretched out his arms on that cross. But it wasn't just the ending when it came to the cross. It was, it was only the beginning because all that he had promised, he told his disciples that he was going to rise again. And such was the case, as we saw in John chapter 20, as he appeared uh, a number of times, 11 the Gospels, the Scriptures tells us about, and, and uh, four in particular here in John's Gospel that we see pointing to the reality that Jesus is alive. And all that he has promised has come to fruition. And here we come to chapter 21, which, which kind of seems like an odd chapter at the end of a book, as, as we noted last week, that, that, that John kind of sums up a conclusion in verses 30 and 31, uh, as he said that there were many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. It, it would seem right that this would be the ending point of, uh, of a great gospel, and, and yet you got chapter 21 that kind of just plays out some, some practical applications. There's some questions still to, to be needed to be answered, and, and John chapter 21 is very practical in that sense, and, and, and so John's given us some illustrations, and, and the question that he is, is, is answering for us is, what about the disciples now? Because we leave them in John chapter 20 up in a, a barricaded room um, trying to figure out exactly what's going on. He appeared to them twice there, one with Thomas, one without. And yet I think the, the question still lingers, and I think John uh, gives us these first 14 verses to, to let us know that there's a transition happening. That this vital relationship that these disciples had with Jesus before his resurrection, was real and tangible. He fed them often. He, 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 he met their needs. He, he taught them. He, he walked with them. He showed them the things of God as he performed miracles. And now, things are going to be different. But he had already taught that too, didn't he? He told them already in John 14, 15, and 16 that the Holy Spirit is coming and that he will be dwelling within the life of the believer and there now is going to be in his departure another one coming who will empower them. And so the scripture has given us the, this transitional period in the life of the disciples of, of what a relationship would look like without the presence of Jesus amongst them. Such is the case that we find ourselves here this morning, doesn't it? We live for Jesus without the presence of a physical presence of Jesus before us. And so this is a... a a chapter in some verses that, that really kind of put the rubber to the road for us when it comes to understanding how to walk with Christ. And he gives us an illustration, and I appreciate that. I think a lot of us are visual. A lot of us are trying to understand and trying to figure things out when it comes to walking with Christ. And, and so this narrative is something that, that is very practical, very simple, yet very important for us to understand. And what we noted last week was that there was really two dynamics going on here, wasn't there? We saw in the first three verses that, that the, the disciples were walking in the flesh. Let me read these verses and make a few comments about it before we pick up our study in verse 4. It says there in verse 1, After these things, Jesus manifested himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. We noted that's the Roman word for the Sea of Galilee. And he manifested himself in this way. So John tells us, the story, Simon Peter and Thomas, called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and the two others of his disciples were together. 
Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we will also come with you. And they went out, got on the boat, and that night caught nothing. Seems just kind of a narrative like we would read a normal book, but there was some, some truth there that, that, that we unpacked the whole issue of, of the disciples going about their own way. We, we already noted in Matthew 28, 16 that, that Jesus had told them to go to a particular mountain and wait for him because he was going to appear to them again. Scriptures are silent about what actually kind of transpired as far as the transition between the disciples. All we know is that Peter gets up, and being the boisterous first leader and the impulsive guy that he is, says, I'm going fishing. He's going back, remember, to what he knew, thinking that the three years of, of ministry with Jesus was over. Yes, it's a, it's a joyful thing to know. I think he's trying to understand theology and, and the impact of this whole thing. Um, I think you can read and maybe insert a few things here that, that he was just going back to what he knew. Never did he consult the scripture. John doesn't tell us that he never, or the other gospels tell us that never that he did he pray or ask the Lord if this is where he should be. And what's interesting to me is that he's got a handful of his disciples to follow him. <laughs> All of them were fishermen except for Thomas. I alluded to the fact that some can speculate exactly why Thomas went with them, but I think Thomas is, is trying to find somebody to follow. Possibly he's, he's wanting to be around Peter, knowing that maybe Jesus will show up again. doesn't want to miss that opportunity like he did before. But they were seasoned fishermen. They, they reverted back to what they knew before Christ. And what's beautiful about this passage is I think just as much as Jesus starts his, his, his ministry at the age of 30 and he goes down to the Sea of Galilee and he calls these men to be fishers of men instead of fishermen, he goes back to the start. And I think this is helpful for us because I, I think he's got to get them recommissioned or rethinking about exactly what and the reason why they were called to be as far as big A apostles. You see a trans transfer of, uh, of now um, divine empowerment that we'll see in the book of Acts and following as we see these disciples start walking with the Lord as they are empowered with the Spirit according to Acts chapter 2. And so I think this is there for us to, to really understand what does it mean to, to walk with the Lord in light of his ascension, in light of him returning back to heaven. Kind of interesting how we picked this up, but we noticed, like I said, that there was utter frustration. I noted at the end of our sermon last week, at the end, look at your eyes, at the end of verse 3, uh, these were experienced men. They, they, they desired to catch fish, and of course, the reason they caught fish was what? To feed their stomachs. And it says that they caught nothing, zilch. Experienced men of the sea, and yet they caught nothing. Now, I would say divinely that, that they were trumped by a sovereign God who made sure that none of those fish went in his nets. The reason I say that is because what follows? What follows in our narrative? Here they were, out in the flesh, desiring to do what they thought was necessary, possibly. Uh, nothing wrong in going fishing, beloved. Don't, don't, don't take that application out of the text or out of context. It was, the fact is, is that they were, they were desiring their own hearts to do things that, that was contrary to what the Lord had called them to be and do. And such is the case for us sometimes, isn't it? Such is the case that we find ourselves thinking that, that we are following the Lord's plan and yet we go about doing our scheming and our own thoughts and our own kicking down doors uh, without ever consulting the Lord and their scriptures and asking exactly what would he want us to do. I think that there's very applicational truth that we could apply to our own soul as we, we see ourselves much like Peter uh, doing some things that we think is right, something's good, and yet finding out later that's, <laughs> that's not exactly what the Lord had intended for us. But there's something more here, and I think 
this is the beauty of our Lord. I think the Lord had every right to come down to the Sea of Galilee and rebuke these guys. I think that he had every right to, for all you CSI fans, if I got the show right, to do a denozo upside Peter's head and said, listen, follow the way of the Lord. He doesn't. He doesn't do that. He doesn't exert his authority. And I think it says something about our Lord and his kindness. And, and Dory uh, alluded to a little bit about in her testimony the fact of how gracious God was her in the midst of trials and, and being able to strengthen her and be able to encourage her. Well, that's exactly what we find here in our passage this morning. For there's this, this dynamic, as I said even last week, that this whole issue of either walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit. And, and beloved, if you're a believer here today, you're in and out of that often and even in the moment and even in, in, in the times of your day you'll find yourselves either walking in the flesh or walking in the spirit if you don't know Christ here there, there's one way that you walk according to Ephesians chapter 2 you will walk in the flesh and you will carry out the desires of the flesh a lot of what Galatians 5 says but for those who are redeemed you have the ability because the spirit now resides in you to be able to walk according to the things of God well, I think this is what he gets us to. Let me read the scripture for us, and we'll kind of walk through this narrative and, and make some comment and pull out some gems. But look at verse 4 there. It says, but when the day was now breaking. So here you have the disciples, the seven guys. They're, uh, they're frustrated, no doubt. Uh, uh, can you imagine the scene? The scripture doesn't give us any account of this, but can you imagine if you're walking in the flesh and you're trying to catch fish, and you're burly, and, and everybody's got an idea how to fish. You ever been fishing on a boat? Um, everybody's got a certain bait or a certain technique or whatever the case may be. you got these seven knuckleheads, and you got Thomas in the middle probably thinking, huh, I don't know what to do. But they're throwing out the net. No doubt they're throwing it all around the net. They're, they're thinking about in the past where they caught fish, and, and, and all these things are going on. Then verse 4 says, but when the day was now breaking, they're fishing into the night. The morning's coming. John tells us that Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus is on, on the shore. Verse 8 tells us that they're roughly 100 yards away. Verse 5 tells us, so Jesus said to them, Children, you do not have any fish, do you? Pretty interesting question. Jesus already knows what? That they have no fish fish and he's kind of just driving them to the point of of, of that reality uh, uh, trying to draw them to the point of their own self-sufficiency and, and, he, and he asks them this question do you have any fish hey mighty fishermen out there do you have any fish literally in the greek do you have any food they answered him no no commentary just no No food, no. All night long, on the sea, and all they experienced was nothing. I think to some degree they were, they were admitting their failure. I mean, um, you've heard about fishermen and their tails and the, and, and the size of fish that they have caught, and, and, and there's, there seems to be pride in that, and um, whatever the case may be, but here they are. The reality is that they don't have any. They respond with a No. And this is where it gets beautiful. I, 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 I just love our Lord here and his character and his love for them as well as to show them that he will not only allow them to, to experience failure in their own self-willedness, if that's a word. Isn't that true in your life? If you've walked with the Lord, you will find, and if you're walking in your own power, in your own flesh, that you will find frustration and you will find distraught you will you'll be irritated of the fact of, of what you thought was right and yet god is is gracious to bring events into our life like i say just referring back dory your, your testimony fits well to our text thinking back as she's at a concert thinking there's more to jesus than what i know about him right now <laughs> look at verse six jesus said to them Cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat, and you will find a catch. Have you thought about that statement for a little bit? Don't you think that they have already cast the net on the right side of the boat? 
Don't you think that, that they had, had, had these nets all around the boat and hoping and trusting that the fish will, will swim into it? And yet a definitive statement from a guy that they don't recognize yet tells them, throw the net on the right side. And then he promises you will find fish. John's narrative is, is pretty clear. I, it, it's, uh, they responded to this. So they, they cast, verse 6 tells us, and then they went, then they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Profound. They throw the nets on the right side and fish sovereignly, as much as they were, were, were kept away from the nets, swim into the net. And now they can't, seven guys, pull this net into the boat. Some, I mean, this, this is just, just remarkable. It, it speaks about the Lord and his provision and, and, and his, his commands. I think the beautiful thing that we can learn from that is that when Jesus said something and they did it, uh, blessings followed. The reality that their nets were so full that they couldn't even pull it in the boat. The simple obedience of, of hearing Jesus' words and obeying. You've heard the song, Trust and Obey. For there's no other way to trust in Jesus than to what? Trust and obey. A simple song to drive home a point that when it comes down to truth, we trust in Christ. And I think that's where the battle sometimes goes with us, doesn't it, beloved? I think sometimes we, we read the scriptures, and, and I don't know if you've ever done this, you read the scripture and say, ouch, you, uh, I, I want to go to a different verse. Because that caused me to do something. That caused me to, 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 to be something. Now, of course, the beautiful thing about the Christian life is that God never calls you to do something or be something unless he empowers you and gives you the resources to do it. Yet, I think in our own stubbornness and, and call, sometimes we've got to humble ourselves and, and we need to trust in what the scriptures say. That story, that truth is throughout the scriptures, isn't it? Go back to the beginning. Go back to the Old Testament. Go back and see the wanderings in the wilderness and, and, and the disobedience of the Israelites. I mean, we're still trying to learn that lesson. As we walk with the Lord, his ways are always better. And sometimes we need to walk in our own ways to find out that his ways are truly good, always right. And so he says, cast the net on the right hand of the side of the boat, you'll find catch. And of course they did. And the fish, the fish jumped into the net. You talk about easy fishing. What a, what a beautiful thing that God of all creation making these fish swim into his net. Let me say it this way, beloved. This is a hard issue for the disciples. It's a hard issue for us. Don't ever think that, that Jesus is some kind of antidotal type of God where it says that if I do this, then he'll bless me with this. This all comes down to a hard issue about trusting the Lord, following his ways, and the benefits of your faith and trusting the Lord. Yes, he does bless those who honor him. That's, that's scriptural. But it's because of a heart, a call, a, a belief, the gospel. All this is, is coming through and, and comes out of them. They obeyed, the Lord provided. And for us, the same is true. We obey, the Lord provides. Some of that is with a clean conscience. And oh, I know many a men, sinful men, who desire to have a clean conscience. And the reality is, is that they would just only come and trust Christ, they would have their forgiveness and their conscience clean. There's a Lord's favor. There's a, there's a deep fellowship with those who trust him, who follow him. It's beautiful. When you align your will with the Lord's will, Beautiful things happen. There's something else I think needs to be noted here. I, I liked the thoughts as I was thinking about this text and 
one commentator kind of brought some things to my mind as, as, I, as I thought through verse 6. Why is it that he told his disciples to throw out the nets instead of having the fish jump into the boat? It's a great question. Why didn't the fish, I mean, he, he commands the uniforms. He could very easily say, fish, jump into the boat and sink their boat with all these fish or have enough for them to, to be able to come in. But I think there's a, there's a right principle here. And this, too, is, is, is throughout scriptures. And we see this in particular with the disciples in our chapter this morning. Is that God desires to show his glory through people. Through willing people. Through people who are his vessels and his tools. He desires for us to be a part of his work. Why? It's his plan and his glory. But he desires to choose us to, to, to be, let me just say it this way, disciple makers. Well, let me ask you about that. Evangelism. We go out, we share Christ. We go out and proclaim Christ. We call people to Jesus. But let me ask you, are you the one who saves them? Absolutely not. But you are called to be a disciple maker, according to Matthew 28. You are called to be an ambassador, 2 Corinthians 5. And God uses the weaknesses of us as tools, as instruments of a message that's not ours to save those who are his. He plans to use you for his glory. Like I said, that, that principle is throughout the scriptures. As a matter of fact, put your finger in John. I want you to just jump to a couple verses in Philippians. Turn forward to Philippians chapter 2. I think this best illustrates this for us. Right after the book of Ephesians, you got Philippians chapter 2. I want you to look at two verses here. Verse 12 and 13. This is the Apostle Paul teaching us here. It says, so then, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit, so then, my beloved, just as you have always, what does it say there? Obeyed. He's commending the, 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 the Philippian believers about their obedience, about their love for the Lord, about their faith, about their desire to follow Christ. He goes on to say, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. He's saying, you know what? Your faith is it's not just a man-pleasing type of faith. Your faith is, is you do it when nobody's looking, even when I'm not here, even when my authority is gone. You are desiring to walk in obedience with the Lord. Then he says this, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That word fear has the idea of reverence. It has the idea of understanding the, the omniscience uh, uh, omniscience as well as the omnipotence of God, the power, the knowledge of God, the, this whole issue of trembling, uh, understanding that, that we are to have some part of our pursuit of pursuing Christ in holiness and, and walking in those things. It, there's this, this, this responsibility of the Christian to pursue Christ and to love Christ. And if you were to end there, you would think, okay, it really rests upon me, doesn't it? But it doesn't end there, does it? Look at verse 13. It says, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Huh. You are called to pursue sanctification with all that you are, but understand this, believer, that, that God is working in you according to his will and for his plan and for his empowerment in you for his glory. They work hand-to-hand, -hand, together together. It's all based on obedience to the things of God. Oh, yeah. this, this work and this relationship, that's why I think the world kind of has a hard time understanding you. My mom. My mom would often rejoice in the work of God in my life. And she'd say, son, she was, she was raised Pentecostal. She goes, 
I know you're kind of Baptist leanings and they have, but you're kind of a Pentecostal. I didn't understand that. I, I just said, you know what, Mom? I said, I, I love the Lord and, and He brings passion to my life and I love His truth. And she would say, Well, you're doing a great job, son. I'm not, I'd stop her and say, No, it's the Lord We're always working within us. And so I'd tell her all the time, and I always would correct her and try to help her understand theology, understand theologically that it's God, it's God, it's God. So one time she said, will you stop it? Will you tra- take any credit for yourselves? I said, no. She goes, well, I read Philippians 4.12. I said, well, okay. You're working with God, yes, I understand that, to, to, to perform his work. I said, but mom, I don't want to take any credit. It's one of those things where but this is the reality of it. Not that you should boast, and nor should you ever boast in, in your own power, but it is God who's working, and, and, and he works with you in your heart to desire obedience that gives God the glory. Amen? Trust that you can see that. This is the relationship that, that he's calling us to, 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 to follow and to understand. This is the relationship that, that he tells them to cast their nets on the right-hand side because in the midst of them casting the net and pulling it up, God is doing a work within the midst of that so that they can believe him all the more. And that's where we find ourselves. I mean, this is, this is beautiful. Look at verse 7. Therefore, the disciples whom Jesus loves, that, of course, is Peter, or John, excuse me, said to Peter. It's the way that John always announced himself in, this, in his gospel. We noted that that's probably just because of his reverence for the Lord, the fact that he never wanted to take credit for that which was divine. He says there in verse 7, Therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. John knew who it was standing on the seashore. And then you have Peter. So John says this to Peter. And then you have the impulse of what we expect of Peter in his heart. So when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put his outer garment on, for he was stripped for work. In other words, they would take off their garments. Uh, they would be kind of in their, their underlying clothes so that they can do the work. And so here, he puts on his outer garments, and he threw himself in the sea, 100 yards away, starts swimming towards the shore, desiring to see Christ, desiring to to see his Lord. (laughs) Isn't that Peter? I mean, so impulsive. Verse 8 tells us the other disciples, because Peter's now jumped, they they got this this huge net of fish, and and so they try to turn it around uh, and head towards the shore. They're just probably, no doubt, just as excited as, as Peter Verse 8 tells us, but the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from the land, about 100 yards away, dragging the net full of fish. And then verse 9. I mean, this continues to get better and better. Verse 9, not only does Jesus provide for them by having this fish jump into this net. Verse 9. So when they got out of the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. The king of glory serving these disciples. Some of the commentators, they, they wondered where Jesus got the fish where, or the charcoal, what was going on. Surely somebody had to bring, it doesn't matter. Jesus Almighty, able to speak the world into existence, if he just created those fish and they were there for their provision. Remember, he is the one who took a a handful of of loaves of bread and a couple of fish and fed 5,000. I mean, it really doesn't matter. You got this divine Lord desiring to to, to serve these guys. It reminds me of Philippians 4.19 where Paul rightly states, in my God, will supply all your needs according to his riches in the glory of Jesus Christ. Some of you need to hear that this morning. Some of you need to understand that you have a God, 
who desires to supply not some of your needs, but all of your needs according to his riches and glory. In Christ Jesus. Verse 10, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have now caught. Simon Peter went up, drew the net to the land, full of large fish, 153, and although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus says, hey, bring some of those. (laughs) I love our Lord because he's drawn Peter back to his provision again. He's drawn him back to the fact of how good he is to him. And John was was pretty specific. Remember, these are the men who couldn't haul the the net in earlier while they were out on sea. He's specific in the fact that there was 153 fish. It says they were large fish. I think that this uh, gives us a little bit of indication, a little bit about who Simon Peter was. No doubt there's adrenaline flowing but he himself was able to to haul this in. And then he has a little statement. (laughs) The net was not torn. For John to add that, you you start thinking to yourself, well, why would he add that? This must have been heavy. I mean, the reality of 153 fish, large fish, some scholars believe that these were probably, you know, two to three to five pound fish. I think it just cements the fact of the honest of John as he recounts this to us, the, that, that, that God even provides for the net to hold his provisions. Pretty powerful stuff. Verse 12. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. A pretty simple statement, but I think that's where we want to be at times when we find ourselves apart from the the blessings of God to hear those words come. Come and eat. And of course, back in those days, to come and eat wasn't just throwing some some fish and some bread on the stove and, and serving it. It meant fellowship. It met communion. It met the ability for now, let's just sit down and let the toils of the day just aside and let us grow together and have a relationship. Sometimes we need to stop. Stop our fretting, stop our our anxiety, stop our fearfulness, and we need to sit at the feet of Christ and have fellowship with him. Verse 12 goes on to say, none of the disciples ventured to question him. Who are you knowing that it was the Lord? Got an interesting statement of none of them are going to be bold enough to say. I mean, Jesus clearly showed himself, manifested himself to them. This clearly was, was Christ. Then in verse 13, Jesus came and took the bread, gave it to them, and the fish likewise. I mean, there's so many scriptures that come back to mind as he was in the upper room on the last week of Passover and taking the towel and washing their feet. I mean, all these things that come, our Lord desires the King of glory to serve you, to bless you, to have a relationship with you. I mean, this is clear as day. He desired these disobedient, self-serving disciples doing their own thing, and yet he comes, he frustrates them because he loves them. Scripture tells us he will discipline those whom he loves, Hebrews. And he brings them back in line. Like I said earlier at the beginning of our sermon, I think this was all about recommissioning them, getting them on, on, on course to what is going to be provided for them, helping them to understand what it means in light of his coming ascension. And then he sums it all up by saying this is now the third time that Jesus was manifested to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. 
specific truth, reality, a living reality. I like what one commentator said at the end of his conclusions, and I echo these words too. He says, and I quote him here, do you see what you've seen here? Do you see it with a spiritual eyes? The pattern is complete, he says. Carnal, fleshly, self-effort, responding to your own will is characterized by disobedience. It ends in failure and a loss of intimate fellowship. He goes on to say, spiritual effort or, or walking in the spirit characterized by obedience produces success and intimate fellowship with Christ. Practical application of, of where we're at with the Lord. I think this illustration is very easy for us to understand. If you're walking in the flesh, expect frustration, expect struggles and trials, expect those things if you're doing what you desire to do. And let me just say this, I think the scripture is very clear that, that, that if you do such a thing, you're walking in disobedience. Let me just be that bold. It is sin. Even if you're, from what you're doing in ministry is what you think that you ought to be doing instead of what the Lord calls you to do, it can be disobedience. If you're sitting there thinking, okay, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? That's the right heart. Um, and let's let me say this from a pastoral standpoint. I'm not getting up here trying to say, hey, this is a big charge for us to, to, to get in front of you of ministry. I want you to be where the Lord wants you to be when it comes to ministry. The problem is, is that some of us think that I don't need to be in ministry. I don't need to be using my spiritual gifts for the greater good of the body. That is wrong because scripturally speaking, we need to be engaged with what God has blessed us with for the greater good of his church. If you're too busy for the things of God, you might be walking in the flesh. Let me say it that way. Trust the Spirit. He stretches us. I'll never forget the time when I was asked to teach little cubbies, three, four, five-year-olds, is that right? Somebody help me. I think that's right. And I'm looking at them. I'm a pastor. I love the scriptures. I get in there and say, open your Bibles. And they're looking at me and like, huh, open what? I'm like, they don't have a Bible. But opening the scriptures, I knew right then that I needed to, to revamp what I was going to teach them and, and give them illustrations about the living Christ and, and be able to teach them the truth without them opening and reading the scriptures. I read some of the scriptures to him because I know that that's what is vital to them, but, but I'll never forget that cubby leader who said, whoa, you gave them a message. And I said, well, what do you mean? It was a plan of salvation. I called them all sinners. I called them that, that they need Christ, and this is the reason why. I had one little cubby raise his hand and said, so I'm going to die in my sins? Yeah. I said, yes, you are. <clears throat> and that, that leader's eyes were real big. I shut the Bible, walked out of there, and uh, only to find next week, Parents coming to me and saying, what did you say to my kid? They are, they are desiring to follow the Lord. I said, well, my desire is not to will them to Christ. My desire is to, to see the Lord open their heart. He goes, well, what would you say? I said, well, ask them. Ask them. It's the gospel. Not necessarily, I share that only in this light. Sometimes we are called to do things that maybe we don't think we're prepared for, but yet God equips us to do it. The issue is to be obedient. The issue is to trust. The issue is to understand that we have a, a, a Savior who desires to provide our needs. And he delights. He delights in your obedience to his truth. And that's what we can walk away with this morning. Wives, kick your husbands in the shins if they start questioning, I don't know about this, when the scripture clearly says, do this. Men, help your wives think rightly when it comes to the scriptures. The Lord commands us to love one another. It's not an option not to love some others, right? Love one another in the power of the Spirit. It's all here. We just need to trust and obey. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for 
the clear truth this morning, illustrated to us in the life of the disciples and, and of course, you, Jesus. Thank you for bringing this truth to our hearts. We need a, a great reminder that it's all about you and not about us. We find ourselves at times caught up in our own selfishness. We, we desire, we, we even manipulate the Christian life, put a spin on it to do what we think is right for us. And yet, Lord, your convicting truth comes and disciplines us. And may I say, not only will you forgive us from those things, but thank you for the disciplining hand of, of you that, that would come and love us that, to that degree to frustrate us in our own efforts. I mean, this speaks on even corporately as a body and then even farther that, even to leadership. May we be led by the Spirit. May we be led by your truth. And may we obey what it says. And may we put our selfish, sinful, fleshly desires aside and may we have your eyes when it comes to serving others and loving others. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your forbearing love. Thank you for your divine love that, that girds us. And we may thank you for your provisions. We see them often and we rejoice. May we never be an unthankful people. May our lips always be full of praise and may we, we recognize you even in the midst of the big blessings as well as the small ones. The nets weren't even broken. You provided and you show your grace and we thank you for that. Teach us, teach us for we are a forgetful people. We, we, we shut our Bibles and we walk out of this place at times and, and we think that's great truth, but the, what we forget it Monday morning and throughout the week. Spirit, impress upon us the truth. Help us to walk in it. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Because the time is, is eluded, um, I'm going to ask that you uh, enjoy one another's fellowship. We encourage each other in grace. Um, if you have any questions about church, about salvation, about, about membership, baptism, how to, how to steer away from sheep that butt you in the head, ask Alex. I'm a shepherd. I'm going to say stay away from the sheep that butt you. Lord, thank you so much again for your grace and mercy. Go with us as we go about. May we be your hands, your, your feet, your mouth. Thank you for the truth that has set us free and is the truth that you've called us to preach. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you.